The platformer game engine comes with only one pre-made level per environment type. You'll likely want to add more as you create your game. Before we do that, let's set up a few things to make things easier for us in the future. Let's duplicate the first game level and move the copy down below the layout called Level UI Layers. Now let's rename it to Day Wilderness BG. Now double click this layout to edit it, click the Layers tab and let's delete the top six layers. Now we're going to rename each remaining layer to make it slightly more descriptive. Once they're all renamed, we'll make them all global in the properties. Once that's done, we'll go back to the original game level we had copied and delete those four bottommost layers that we had kept, renamed, and made global in the copy of the layout. Now we'll create four new empty layers, but name them to match the exact same names of the layers we made global in the copy layout. Copying and pasting makes this process error-proof. You'll notice that by making those background layers global, then making layers with the same exact name in the game level, this adds those global layers to the game level. This is the same method used in the game HUD and fade layers. This way, just like you only need to edit one globally used layer if you want to change the game HUD, you can now use one global background layer for each environment type, and if you change or add to that one global layer, it will be updated in every game level that uses that global layer. This saves you a lot of time and helps keep the game file smaller and faster to load. You should eventually do this for all environments, but for now we'll stick to this daytime wilderness environment. Now that we have this first layout using global background layers, let's duplicate it again, but this time we're actually going to turn this copy into an actual new game level. Double click the copied layout so we can begin customizing it. The most important layer to change is the one called FG, which stands for Foreground. This is the layer that always contains the part of the environment the player actually interacts with, the player character, enemies, etc. But before we work on that layer, there's another layer we need to cover. Unlock the layer called FG No Collide Tiles and make sure all other layers are locked. And let's hide the FG layer for now. If you single click in the layer, you'll see a very large object gets selected. If you double click, you'll see it's the tile set for the part of the environment the player actually interacts with. Just close that again and click the Tile Map tab. This will bring up the tools needed to actually start changing the lay of the land for this game level. Make sure the pencil tool is selected, select any tile, and click anywhere in the layer to paste that tile down into the tile map. If you left click and drag, you can select a rectangular block of tiles to draw with. If you click the rectangular drawing tool, you can fill large areas with tiles quickly. Single tiles or rectangular selections you have selected will be repeated within the rectangle you draw out in the layer. Switching from the pencil tool to the eraser tool lets you remove tiles from the layer. If you have the full version of the platformer engine, you'll notice there are two separate tile map objects using the same environment tile set. The second, topmost tile map found in the FG layer is only needed for levels that include areas of water. You can learn more about it in the video dedicated to adding water to a level, which I'll link to in the description. If you are certain you won't be adding water to the level, you can delete this topmost environment tile map. If you will be adding water, just keep the FG layer hidden while you're designing your level, then clear the topmost tile map by loading the empty tile map file we've included and then follow the instructions in the adding water video to add the needed tiles where they should go in the topmost tile map. It's very important to know that editing this tile map only changes the look of the game level. There is a second hidden tile map used for the collisions. Lock the FG no collide tiles layer and unlock the FG layer. In the tile map tools, click the selector icon and then click in the layer to select the collision tile map. Now you can begin editing the actual collision tile map to match your new level design. Because the visual tile map and collide tile map are separate, you could even create hidden holes in walls, floors, etc. for players to discover. Once the tile maps are set, you might want to add other environmental elements. For areas like the bridge, you might want to make a jump through platform the player can jump up through from beneath. Under Project, Object Types, find the sprite called Jump Through. Drag it into the FG layer, place it and stretch its width as needed. 
The trees for this environment are actually spider objects, but you don't have to blindly play spider objects and then run the layout to see how the placement and size looks. Instead, you position, scale, and rotate these placeholder sprites named Wilderness Tree Placeholder. And when the layout starts, the engine automatically replaces all the placeholder sprites with the real spriter objects, scaled and rotated exactly as you had done with the placeholder sprites. It's important to know that if you hold the tab key and then left click, you can select objects that are behind other objects in the layout. Also, be sure to use the Z order bar whenever you need to adjust the Z order of objects. The player's Z order is based on the Z order of the invisible player rectangle sprite, so use this to make sure the player will be properly displayed in front of or behind the environment objects as desired. There are also spikes you can add which will hurt the player if they fall onto them. You can add a minus symbol to their height and make them ceiling spikes that would hurt the player if they jump into them. You can also add moving platforms. There are currently cloud-based ones or stone ones. Once you drag them on screen, you can change their sign behavior to make them move either horizontally or vertically and to adjust how quickly they move and how far they move back and forth. You can also find and place either the basic enemies or the flying enemies as you see fit. The flying enemies also have a vertical sine wave behavior like the moving platforms which you can tweak to change how quickly and how far the movement will go. It's important to also place enemy turner sprites wherever you want basic enemies to turn around. This is used not only to stop enemies from walking off of deadly falls, but also can be used to make basic enemies patrol specific sections of a longer stretch of ground. You can add bouncy mushroom sprites and set their variables to affect how high the player will bounce either with the jump button held down or not held down, and also if the bounce pushes the player horizontally as well. Play with the values and test until you get your desired result. If you have the full version of this platformer game engine, you'll also need to add and adjust hill detect sprites on all slopes in order for the player's balance check animation to not play whenever the player is standing on a slope. If your level includes a deadly fall out of the layout, you need to make sure there is a deadly fall sprite and that it is below the layout. When the player reaches the same Y coordinate or lower than this sprite, the player will die. If there is no deadly fall in the level, then you shouldn't have a deadly fall sprite in the layout. As you can see, there is a layer called FFG, which represents a scrolling layer closer to the player's eyes, or camera, than the foreground layer. For the illusion of extra depth, this layer scrolls faster than the foreground layer. While this creates a cool extra sense of depth, there's a risk of the art in this layer obscuring the player's view of their own place in the foreground or obscuring critical items or enemies. To avoid this, you can position the Fade FFG sprite to the vertical position where you'd like the FFG layer to fade to transparent once the player goes lower than that. When the player goes back above that position, the FFG layer will fade back in to fully opaque. When you've finished creating your new custom level, you need to adjust a couple of things to plug it into the actual game among the other levels. If it's the second level, you need to name it 2 and shift the name of the levels that follow it. In order to not have to constantly change the names of many levels every time you want to insert a new one, let's temporarily rename each of the levels by adding the letter A after the numbers. Now you can add as many levels as you need, rearranging their order in the list to keep track of the flow of your game while you work. Once you're done adding all the new levels, you should then fix their numbering to go from 1 onward. While you're doing this, it's a good time to also make sure each level has an exit level sprite and that its where to value is set to the number of the next game level. Level 1's where to value should be set to 2 and so on. The exit level sprite should be stretched to cover the entire possible area the player might be able to go at the very end of each level. The fade out and exit of the level will be triggered as soon as the player overlaps any part of this exit level sprite. Thanks for watching.